Our first guest is a veteran of film and television production, turned writer, comedian, and storyteller. He has performed sketch and improv at Second City, IO Chicago, and the Annoyance Theater. He is currently a writer and performer for local sketch comedy troupe Cassandra, which has been featured at Chicago Sketch Fest as well as the Printer's Row Lit Fest. Cassandra also has a monthly residency here at Hopleaf, where they perform live radio style sketch and music every last Tuesday of the month, so I'm sure you come back for that. Please welcome Brian Heath. Ian is correct, I am a comedian, but I warn you now, this is not comedy, so don't whisper for yourself. This isn't funny. It's not funny. <laughs> this is a, a story I wrote about my life, and it's called Day 60. It was a typical Saturday afternoon when I was visiting my dad in the suburbs. I was sipping a Sprite, and he was drinking his Miller Lite. The TV was set to Encore Westerns, as that was by far his favorite genre of film. The original True Grit played in the background, and Dad and I reminisced over how close we came to losing him, and how lucky we were to be able to have these simple moments, just like Dad's. Midway through the conversation, I realized that I had broken ribs, and I lifted my shirt to reveal bruising up and down my left side. <laughs> we laughed about how I not only forgot I had the injury, but I also had no idea how I incurred the injury in the first place. Shortly afterward, we were interrupted by this loud alarm, and we started running around the room looking for it. We frantically started searching. We just couldn't find the source. And that's when I opened my eyes, and I sat up in the crappy foldy bed. My ribs ached from sleeping for too long in that stupid bump that separated the two parts of the bed. I reached over and turned off the alarm, and it was 8 a.m. on May 30th of 2014, and today was day 60. I staggered into the bathroom to pee and brushed my teeth as I shook off yet another denial dream, as I like to call them. I'd grown fond of these denial dreams. They were the only times I was able to escape the underlying fear and sadness that had become pretty much a fixture in my life. And even though I'd always wake up and realize the dream wasn't real and that indeed I was living my worst nightmare, at least for one moment, even if it was just a dream, that feeling disappeared. And I considered these dreams a welcome vacation from reality. And that reality was that my father was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer on March 25th of last year, 60 days from this date. I realized I was going to lose the most important, most important person in my life, and now we are in day 15 of this hospice day. His death was coming any day, but until that happened, I had a schedule to stick to. Now that I knew up from down, it was time to start the day. Dad was still sleeping, so I tiptoed past him into the, to the next room, the hospice center was buzzing. There were two new patients admitted overnight. The office was full of new faces. I took it all in for a second as I stood there in my favorite t-shirt, which was now transparent, camouflage PJ pants, a bright case of bedhead, and I just watched the scene. I waved hello to the staff, whom I've grown to know very well since moving in over two weeks ago. And at this point, they knew, they knew my routine as well as I knew theirs. A nurse walked by, handled, handed me a towel, and I headed into the oversized handicapped accessible showers to clean up. I exited the shower and made my dad's breakfast request at the front desk before re-entering the room. Dad was awake. I dropped my things back in the corner of the room and told him that food was on its way. At this point, he was no longer able to speak, so we had devised a system of tongue and eye movements to communicate, so he assured me that he was happy with my breakfast choice, and at that point, I went downstairs to the main cafeteria of Northwestern Community Hospital. I sat in my usual spot with my usual eggs and my usual coffee. And this cafeteria had also become incredibly predictable. It was easy to spot and identify the different groups of people who frequented this place at 8.30 in the morning. There were the med students who sat in the elevated area to my left. There were the big deal doctors who quietly sat in a corner to my right. The nurses usually sat together in the center of the space, while the custodial staff was scattered in different paths, which I concluded were indicative of what floor they were on. Then, of course, there were people just like me, family. The reasons for, be for them being in the hospital cafeteria were very easily readable. If a table was jovial, then perhaps it was a birth, or maybe they were just there for their aunt's hip replacement. If the table was quiet and somber, then they were probably like me, in the club or soon to be in the club. 
I wrapped breakfast and grabbed all of today's papers for Dad to read from the gift shop, as I always did. And the hospital was busy this morning, so I let a large group enter the elevator before me, and another gentleman waited next to me. As I entered, I hit the button for the top floor of the hospital. Hospice floor. The other gentleman didn't hit a button on the floor, which meant he was probably in the club. We made brief eye contact and quickly broke it off to stare in opposite directions. And yeah, he was definitely in the club. You see, there's a certain look and demeanor about everyone in that lives through this circumstance. It's a certain thing they carry. And I feel like once you've lived it or have lived it, you can spot it very easily. I believe it's a combination of emotional exhaustion and surrender. To me, the emotional exhaustion is the trickiest part to manage. In my experience, I had been fighting for my father's life and then his proper treatment and then getting him into a decent hospice, let alone dealing with the fact that he was dying for so long that my emotional wall was paper thin. I was capable of extreme anger, sadness, and laughter over anything. All sad songs had to be removed from the iPod because I was afraid I'd have a public breakdown. Even the dumbest, stupidest arguments between my family would erupt into full down, full on throwdowns. And the stupidest jokes had me laughing for minutes. There was already enough drama happening, and I didn't want to lose it and cause more. It was me who was in charge of my dad. He put me in full charge. And I had to maintain an image for him, and I had to maintain an image for the whole family at the same time. So I returned to our room, I went through the routine of speaking to doctors, head nurses, social workers, and the pastor as they did their daily walkthroughs. At this point, these people were more here for me than they were for him. There were no more battles to win. There were no more choices to make. There was no more fighting for his dignity with health insurance, nothing. I had even paid for and planned the funeral. At this point, all that was left to do was try to have fun. My method for doing so was to create a party atmosphere in the room every day. There were no tears allowed around death. He knew what was happening. We all knew what was happening. What was the point of bringing it up all the time? We have plenty of time to be sad later. Why not just have fun now? It was just past noon, which meant visitors were on the way and it was time to open the bar. That's right, I got the go ahead to serve alcohol upon being admitted to hospice. <laughs> so every day around 1 p.m. the party started. Over the next six hours we'd sip gimlets and that shitty beer he wanted and his friends and the daily rotation of family would come through. Today his buddy Joe would tell me a story of a work project that was falling apart years ago. The company had a contract to produce parts for this global transport company but the problem was that once they built the parts and put them in the machines, the machines didn't work. My father was called to come over and take a look at the design, at the design that was baffling countless engin other engineers. And I'm told it took him 30 seconds to not only figure out the problem, but figure out a fix for the remaining parts they had already built. This wasn't the first time one of these coworkers told me my dad was a genius. They would come in day by day and do the same thing. Then I countered with a story about how I made my dad my my date to my friend's wedding. We shared one of those apartment cars on the train down to St. Louis, and Dad became the star of a rock and roll wedding. He spent the night cutting up the rug with a bunch of my old female friends until it was time to, to go. They had to pull him off the floor. But in his usual fashion, he wasn't quite ready to call it a night. So we, still in our fancy suits, went to the bougiest place we could find in St. Louis. We spent the next three hours sipping martinis like we owned the place. You see, as an adult, our relationship shifted to a friendship, and then we became best friends. This wedding story is just one of hundreds I could tell you about adventures with Brian and Dad. Anyway, things were going well today, and we were celebrating the good times and toasting to this guy who provided them. But it was approaching 7 p.m., which meant pretty much everyone was going home for the day. However, that meant my Uncle Dave was gonna come visit for the night. Dave was my father's closest brother, and they were super tight. Dave could make Dad laugh at any moment. Even when Dad lost the ability to speak, Dave could just lean over and whisper in his ear, and I could see the man just heaving with laughter. We were his two favorite people, and we were excited for the night because Blackhawks were on it. Blackhawks were playing the Kings, so we pulled the laptop in front of him, and we huddled around his bed. We watched the game. Uh, at the time, Dad's attending technician for the night was a really nice guy named Eugene. 
and Eugene frequently stopped in for updates on the score. But it seemed every time Eugene walked in, the Hawks did bad, so we kicked him out. <laughs> <laughs> he was also a sports weirdo, so he didn't mind. However, he did have to come in and do daily maintenance um, after the first period. So Dave and I would retreat to the main common room of the hospice center. The common room is, is similar to a common room, and I would say a dorm. There is plenty of room to sit. There's a big TV. There's a little kitchenette, you know, hot plate, microwave, sink. And then there's a big bookshelf with a bunch of paperbacks and giant, I say giant, but this big block letters that at this case, at this time, they spelled out love. Well, Dave and I got pretty bored after a while. It was about 15, 20 minutes. We were waiting for this to be done, and we were a little buzzed. So we decided to take it upon ourselves to see if we could have fun with the block letters and spell something out stupid. We didn't have a lot of letters to work with, so we settled on the word MILF. And just then, Eugene knocked to let us know it was OK to return to the room. So we didn't change it, and we just ran back to the room. And we stifled our giggles as we ran through the hospice center, only to erupt in laughter upon entering the room as if we were 11 and we just got away with TPing a house. <laughs> Damn it, Eugene. The Hawks gave up a goal while you were cleaning up the room. Of course the Hawks gave up a goal when they were cleaning up, while you were cleaning up the room. They would eventually escape with a 4-3 victory, but it was getting late, and it was time for Dad to go home. Dave to go home. We said our goodbyes, and I transferred back into comfy pants and the see-through shirt. But I wasn't ready to call it a night. So I, had, I headed back into the common room to reheat and finish off the pizza. To my surprise, the room was full with about 20 people. The hospice had just admitted a new patient. And you know, I couldn't tell if these people were like me or not. Did, were they here because a loved one was very sick and now this is the end? Or were they here because this is a sudden thing? There's no telling, and really, it doesn't matter. The only thing that was obvious was that they were wrapping their, their heads around hopelessness for the first time. And that seemed like ages ago for me. And there I was in my sleepy clothes, standing in the room with them, microwaving a pizza. And there was definitely uncomfort in the room. They, they pretty much grew silent once I started the microwave, so I cut it short real fast. And just before I left, I stopped to look at them, and I gave them my best, hey, I know what you're going through, and it sounds crazy, but it's going to get a little bit easier, sort of look, the best that I could do that. And it was then that my thin emotional barrier began to crackle again. Laughter was sneaking in, not the place for it. I could feel my smile muscles convulsing as I witnessed these poor folks conferring over their worst nightmare, and all the while behind him in big block letters, it said MILF. <laughs> it's amazing the things you find hilarious when you're in a tragedy. But I honestly hope one of them might notice it. And even if it made them mad, if it made them happy, if they laughed out loud, for one second they might forget where they are. And I hurried back to the room and closed the door behind me. It was, now it was time for bed. Day 60 would be a wrap, and I said goodnight to Dad, unfurled the foldy bed, made sure to reset the alarm for the morning so I could do all of this all over again just as it happened. But just before my, I closed my eyes, I turned the TV to Encore Westerns, and I thought, tonight, maybe both of us can have a vacation break. Thank you. <laughs>